Okay. Ernesto, welcome this morning. I'm sorry uh, about how difficult this was to catch no on, but I'm excited yeah, to have you. And in fact, I listened to your TED Talk, which I thought was terrific, and everybody should listen to that TED Talk. Thank so you. if Thank you, you could uh, tell us a little bit about your background and about uh, the Soroli Institute, uh, that would be a great start. Sure. Um, Italian born, uh, started to work very, very young in uh, Africa uh, for uh, in international aid projects, uh, technical cooperation with African countries. Um, I was 21 years old and I was already traveling through Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria and so on. Um, and became very, very disillusioned with uh, our way, um, the Italian way to do international aid, we would arrive uninvited to tell local people what to do. And when you do that, uh, you uh, usually suffer the consequences of your arrogance because um, uh, as I described in my TED talk, we arrived in Zambia convinced that we could uh, alleviate the hunger of the local people. So we taught local people how to plant tomatoes and uh, uh, zucchini and uh, <laughs> Italian cultural produce. Um, but we did it uh, at great expense, uh, moving lots of people and uh, buying land. And, uh, and as soon as the tomatoes were nice and ripe uh, overnight, some 200 hippos came out of the river and they ate all the delicious Italian tomatoes. So we understood um, the wisdom of the local people and why they were not planting anything around their village because the village was on the Zambezi River. And if you plant anything, you attract first the hippos and then the elephants. Uh, but we were too arrogant to ask the local people how come they had uh, agriculture. So um, I became disillusioned with our programs of international aid. Uh, they would only last as long as the money will last. But as soon as the money will run out, the local people will go back to do exactly what they were doing before they met us. Uh, so I became intrigued by uh, an economist who was working in Africa at the same time. He was of German background, working in England. And he had an approach that was very, very different. He would just find out what the problems were locally and then help local people solve their own problems. Um, and I went to finish my degree, uh, my first degree in political sciences from Rome University. And I decided to do a doctorate of research, a PhD on uh, uh, this idea of responsive development. So um, uh, I went to South Africa, Stellenbosch University, and then I moved my dissertation from South Africa to Australia. And uh, for the last uh, 40 years, I've been a practitioner of uh, a very, very uh, complicated, very strange methodology that can be, um, um, <laughs> can, can be described as shut up, and listen, find out first what the local, local people problems are, and then um, help local people do beautifully what they already love to do. So um, invented uh, a, a new profession called enterprise facilitation. Uh, if invited, we go to a community and then we train a local person to shut up and listen and to offer um, free confidential support to any person locally who has a dream and is self-motivated but do, does not know how to transform talent, uh, energy, and imagination into a way of feeding the family. We've done this now in 400 communities worldwide, um, and we have uh, helped to start uh, an estimated 55,000 businesses in 17 countries in the world. Uh, some 25 years ago, I was invited to come to America. I am one uh, of those um, O-1 visas uh, <laughs> um, for uh, uh, 
national waiver for uh, uh, exceptional merit. Um, and uh, I was invited to come and uh, um, we've, um, I was encouraged by a group of uh, American friends to establish a 501c3, the Sirolli Institute International Enterprise Facilitation. Uh, we are a social enterprise. We never write grants. We never act, um, ask for charity. We sell services which are training communities and leaders on how to establish their own enterprise facilitation projects to capture the energy imagination of their own people. All right. So, and, and, and you talked a lot about that even in your TEDx talk that people have to be self-motivated, that you can't tell them what to do. They have to want to do it, right? Anybody who said to me that they can motivate people, I asked them, show me how you motivated your uh, teenager daughter. <laughs> and if they can do that, <laughs> I believe them. <laughs> I no, found I think I, that I, we I, cannot motivate anybody. I think that we can simply um, uh, encourage their growth and we can support, create an environment that is supportive. But uh, I am um, certainly not a behaviorist. I'm not a behavior modification guy. Um, my psychology is different, and uh, we can talk about it later if you want. <laughs> well, let's talk about, you know, why did you write this book? Well, uh, it was my second book, and um, I started to uh, write a book that uh, was never ending. And after seven years of writing it, uh, uh, Martha, my, uh, my wife and a colleague, uh, and my partner, Martha said to me that she, I needed uh, an intervention, you know, because I was, <laughs> I was like an, a, 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 a dry addict. I was addicted to my, my book and I would never let it go. So we uh, spoke to a, a publisher in New York, Square One Publishing, and Square One um, uh, employed a, uh, a copy editor to come in, take the book, the manuscript, uh, out of my clenched fist and uh, create uh, a book that he wanted was uh, uh, to be very readable, very simple to understand, that was basically en encapsulating what we taught our enterprise facilitators to do in villages when people would come to say, you know, we are 47 women, we are producing turmeric, uh, and it's the best turmeric in uh, Nepal, but we do not know how to sell it and we are not making enough money. Or how, what do we tell people who have a, um, a passion uh, for something, but they cannot make a living out of it. So the book is uh, very much um, uh, business uh, support, business advice that we share with uh, would-be entrepreneurs. Um, and um, is uh, something that comes out of experience, comes out of doing it. Uh, I never studied business, I studied psychology. So it's an application of uh, psychology to entrepreneurship. So uh, Adam Grant, who's a professor at the Wharton School, wrote a book called The Originals, uh, where he talked about starting a part-time, uh, starting your venture part-time, and then if it exploded, then you would leap into a full-time. But if it didn't, you'd keep your full-time job. <laughs> what, 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 what do you recommend to people that they do? Should they start the yeah. venture part-time and keep that income coming in, or should they leap in with both feet? Uh, well, uh, we can be, I think that there's lots of wisdom in what uh, 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 Grant uh, suggests. Um, uh, there is a very um, sophisticated language that we can use to the same <laughs> concept, which is a minimum viable product, an MVP. Before you, <laughs> before you stop doing your daily job, uh, you should have somebody taking your product to the market to show it to 200 uh, possible potential buyers to say, if we were to make this, would you purchase it? <laughs> and if you get 80% uh, say, wow, fantastic, please do it then you're in business. So um, what we recommend is that uh, uh, as soon as possible, you should, uh, uh, instead of hiding the secret uh, and say, I cannot show this invention to the world because it's the best uh, uh, thing, you know, after sliced bread, 
what we say is that no, 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 that's not wise. What you should say, you should go to the market as soon as possible, even with a prototype to say, if we were to build it, would you be interested? Because there is only one boss. There is only one, one institution that can decide whether your product is going to sell or not. And that's the market. And the market is fierce. <laughs> the market has no pity, takes no prisoners. <laughs> so it's a very, very good idea to expose your baby to the market. Uh, and I call it baby because product people tend to become so attached to their invention that to them is like a baby. <laughs> and uh, you will see uh, if, when we touch upon the psychology of the creator of the product, um, they actually are not the best people to take the baby to the market because they cannot take uh, rejection. So um, we uh, advise uh, our entrepreneurs with a nice product or a new service to immediately partner with a uh, marketing person, a commercial person who can take the product to the market, listen to the feedback, come back to say they want it, but they only want it if it is uh, pink because women have discovered these backpacks and you only make them camouflage <laughs> and they want <laughs> pastel colors. <laughs> so are you prepared to modify your uh, production of backpacks? to accommodate a market that you never considered. So this is what we say. We say an MVP, minimum viable products as soon as po possible. And before you leave your day job, make sure that you have tested the market uh, in, a, in a very, um, maybe um, inexpensive, inexpensive way. You know, maybe even with computer gra uh, graphics, with uh, Go to the market, say, if we were to build this, would you be interested in uh, putting it on, on your shelves? And if um, Patagonia says, oh my God, that's fantastic. Well, <laughs> then you can come back, regroup, prepare a, uh, a business plan, uh, raise the funds and maybe leave your day job. But if nobody is interested in your fantastic idea, Maybe the fantastic idea is other before its times. Uh, maybe you are in the wrong um, uh, historical moment for that idea. You are, maybe there is a pandemic happening. <laughs> it's not the right time to launch. Uh, well, Ernie, I've, I've experienced that myself. I started an insurance product uh, to insure small business bank accounts against cyber theft in every survey that I did and the insurance company that invested in me looked phenomenal. And then when we went to sell it, it was a very inexpensive product. You bought it online, two minutes and 40 seconds. You filled out the application, you were done. But we were too far ahead of, the, of it because even though the surveys look good, when we actually asked people 10 months into it, when we were getting no, essentially no sales, and we said to them, is it a problem for you? Only 7% of people responded that they thought it was a problem for them. And now, of course, every insurance product now uh, for cyber insurance now includes what we were offering six years ago, but we were too far ahead of it. Uh, yeah. why, is, why is it important to love what you do? I mean, there's a real importance to that for survival, right? You know, uh, because the ups and downs. So why is it important to love what you do? Because business is too hard and you get knocked back. And if you don't really love what you're doing, you are going to become discouraged after the first, uh, you know, five times uh, that, uh, you know, you have to, to start again from scratch because all your plans were false because all the, because uh, the market is so cruel. Um, if you don't love what you're doing uh, the first time, second time, third time that you have to, uh, you know, crawl up again <laughs> from the dust you're going to give up so love is um, there are two words one is love the other one is passion and uh, uh, when i said you have to love it i also say you have to be passionate about it now being passionate about it is very much more relevant because the word passion comes from the latin and it means to suffer that's why they uh, uh, we call 
the passion of Christ on the cross was the suffering of Christ on the cross. So uh, to be passionate means uh, be prepared to suffer for it. And uh, in business, you have to be prepared to suffer uh, for it. And uh, um, the, def the best definition of entrepreneur that I got uh, ever is from uh, a legendary investor in Silicon Valley, Bob Bozeman. His uh, venture capital firms invested in 360 Silicon Valley startups. Uh, this guy is a legendary. In fact, you should interview him, Mark. Uh -huh. And uh, But um, his definition of entrepreneur is somebody who wakes up in the middle of the night uh, with an uh, anxiety attack because he does not know how to pay the, uh, the salaries at the end of the month. And uh, only those who've been in business understand the elephant on the chest the feeling of waking up with a panic attack in the middle of the night, not knowing how to carry on. Um, and uh, what he was telling us at this uh, meeting um, uh, some time ago was that uh, the average ent entrepreneur has uh, suffered <laughs> of the elephant of the chest uh, in, some dramatic, in some dramatic measures, at least two or three times in the professional uh, uh, lives. So you have to be prepared to uh, suffer and you're not going to be prepared to suffer unless you love what you do. Uh, what's your definition of entrepreneur? I mean, you gave us that definition, but like my, for instance, my father was a shopkeeper in a small town, never wanted to expand beyond that. Do you think yeah. entrepreneurs uh, are people who are building scalable businesses? Or entrepreneurs uh, can be anybody who starts a business. I would like to give you the, uh, 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 this is a kind of interesting story because um, the, the word, the Anglo-Saxon word used for entrepreneur, uh, the Anglo-Saxon people say that that's a French word. And I'm Italian. And uh, we Italians would like to tease the French. And we said to the French that they have no language. That's why they invented miming. Uh, it's because all the language, the French, is all Latin. And uh, the word entrepreneur is identical uh, to the Italian word intraprendente. It's exactly the same word. So if the French call it entrepreneur and we call it intraprendente, obviously there is a mother a word there is an original word that is not Italian, not French. And that word is Latin. So I went to find out what the word entrepreneur <laughs> was in Latin. And the word in Latin is uh, come from the word intraprehendere. And intraprehendere, I'm I going to show it to you. Intra -pre Intraprehende. So look at this word. Intraprehende. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So the beauty about this word is uh, where does it come from? Intra in Latin means among. Pre in Latin means the first. Hendere means to get. So the word in Latin means the first among others to get. So to get it. So intraprehendere in Latin it was an, uh, it's an adjective. It's like to say somebody who's cr uh, courageous, somebody who is intraprendente means somebody who is the first one among others to, to see an opportunity. So your father was not an, uh, an entrepreneur. Your father was a businessman, <laughs> was a shopkeeper. Uh, the definition of entrepreneur is about it's a quality of uh, the soul, a quality of the character, which allows people who see an opportunity to, to go out there and seize it. So, uh, and some people become entre entrepreneurial all, only late in life because when they're young, they are too scared to risk all. So right now in America, the average, uh, uh, the age, the average age of entrepreneurs is, is about 45 years of age. It's not true that millennials are very entrepreneurial, not at all. It's the 45 to 50 who are the most entrepreneurial in America right now. Now, you've traveled around the world working with entrepreneurs all over the globe, am I correct? Yeah. 
Yes. And, and I always thought, uh, and, and I've traveled too, I always thought that that was America's competitive advantage. Are we still the most entrepreneurial country in the world? Or are there other countries that are exceeding us in terms of their focus? I've seen some, I've, I've seen some, uh, I see some uh, uh, every year that is a uh, global um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, survey and uh, it gives some very in interesting uh, figures. Uh, I, for instance, uh, one of the things that I did not know is that uh, they, uh, the country with the highest numbers of women entrepreneurs in the world is Spain, where 80% of businesses are started by women. But um, uh, America has the reputation, not numerically, I don't think that America is the most entrepreneurial, but certainly in terms of quality and of investment, uh, they what the competitive advantage of entrepreneurship in America is the amount of ven venture capital that uh, America uh, has at its own disposal. Uh, compare, if you look at the statistics of the venture capital funds in America versus uh, the rest of the world, is uh, uh, the difference is stratospheric. No company. Whoops. Americans are prepared to uh, to use to back enterprises. The greatest uh, feature of the uh, of the American um, um, the American uh, middle class, the American um, uh, wealthy individual, is uh, the uh, uh, the willingness to risk investing in new ventures. And I think is the greatest compliment to your uh, uh, personality, to the economy, and to the strengths of uh, uh, American resolve to point to innovation as a possible um, you know, uh, betterment for everybody's future. So huge uh, investment. Uh, um, in entrepreneurship. That's what distinguished the American society. Is there any countries that stand out for you that America is competing against in terms of the quality of entrepreneurship? It, not, in, not in absolute term. There is no country in the world that comes to the same numbers or even close to the patents that uh, the uh, Americans uh, uh, you know, um, submit to the, your uh, um, a patent office, no country in the world comes closer. And remember that uh, uh, Americans uh, obliterate the, the rest of the world in uh, uh, Nobel Prizes. Americans have won 380 Nobel Prizes, uh, um, and this is, uh, they, you have obliterated the rest of the world in the last century. So there is an extraordinary amount of uh, uh, research uh, that Americans still conduct. And remember that all modern, the technology that we use in this phone, as you uh, well know and you well understand, all the bits of technology were government owned. And it was government patents that had been utilized by private sector. And uh, the American money, the, see, if the American uh, public would really would like to make money, they, uh, the American government should have uh, trademarked everything and, uh, and uh, uh, get the royalties from all over the world because uh, the technology was not private technology, the technology was public technology that your, your advanced research um, had generated. So um, Americans like to hate uh, the government. They have this kind of disdain for the government, but actually the American government uh, um, has, um, uh, as, be, as the one that uh, has uh, won the war, uh, the Second World War, uh, the American government is the, uh, has funded pure research that has really created the preconditions for your, uh, um, uh, your uh, uh, technology revolution. The microchip, everything was, uh, there is a reason for Silicon Valley, and the reason for Silicon Valley was your uh, war arsenals in uh, in Southern California, so in Northern California. So um, huge, huge amount of research and investment in uh, pure research. Um, 
which has made this country uh, an absolute um, uh, winner in terms of innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, you had said in your book, uh, you thought early on the government could drive entrepreneurship and obviously government uh, positively affects entrepreneurship in the example you just gave, but you changed your view. What changed and what's your view now? Uh, my, uh, I changed my view in, in terms of my own uh, relationship with government. Uh, I, what has happened with government is that when government discovered my enterprise facilitation projects, uh, they loved it and they said, let's set up enterprise facilitation, uh, enterprise facilitators in communities. Uh, and they're right. If we had enterprise facilitators in, the, uh, in uh, South LA working with African-American entrepreneurs, we would have so many uh, happy uh, um, African-American entrepreneurs that we will solve some of the social tension in those communities. So it's absolutely true that government, um, when they discover that you can foster entrepreneurship, they were very enthusiastic. The problem for an organization like mine, working with government is the kiss of death, because as soon as the government changes, the people that uh, of the new political party they will slaughter you. They will absolutely obliterate you. So the beauty of the Siroli Institute is that on my board, it's a non-profit, so on, I have a board, and the board is uh, half Republicans and half Democrats. And people say, how did you manage that? <laughs> and I said, because they both love uh, what we do, but for completely different reasons. The Republicans on my board, they believe that entrepreneurship is the uh, way America has been founded. And, when, and they say that what we do is patriotic because we help people not by giving them money, but we teach them how to fish. We teach them how to set up successful companies. The Democrats on my board, they absolutely love the idea that we are um, fostering personal growth that we help people to become the best they can be, <laughs> that we are inclusive in our approach, that we don't pick winners, that we help anybody in a community, including the, uh, you know, uh, the cleaning lady uh, from Mexico who uh, wants to set up a cleaning company and from being employed as a cleaner, we help her in California to set up a cleaning agency where she employed some uh, 12 other uh, Latino women to, set, to go and clean the houses of people. So we transform the cleaning lady into an entrepreneur. So we have uh, uh, both um, people on our board. I think it's very, very dangerous for us to be associated with one uh, political uh, political system because as soon as that, that uh, uh, government will lose control, then we will be painted with the brush of having been the friends of that governor. And uh, because now the government is ousted, uh, we will be uh, painted with the same brush. Yeah, yep. We have worked with very, we, uh, with strong, strong Republican governors in America. In, uh, in Texas with Governor Perry, and we have set up projects in, uh, uh, in very democratic <laughs> uh, uh, counties in, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, in Pacoima, you know. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to work with government in the sense that we do not want to be then painted with a political brush. Well, in a, just briefly, in a very brief description, what's unique about what you offer that uh, American, uh, cities have brought you in to work with them or regions of the country what what is it that you do that's so unique is so um, economic development is usually done by trying to attract corporations to come to your poor community the poorest the community the more they the dream of the economic development director will be to try to find some what they call inward investments or business attraction and use some tax concession to attract businesses. What we do instead, we, uh, we get the, uh, the council uh, to employ or uh, retrain one of the, the personnel. And uh, what we do, we concentrate on what is already in the community. And so it's very, very low cost, uh, with only the salary of an individual. 
who then works with uh, any ounce of intelligence in the community and helps uh, this uh, man or this woman transform their own idea into a, uh, a viable business. And it could be a cooperative employing 50 farmers who want to buy a meat work. Uh, this is a project that uh, I worked in uh, Redwood in uh, Minnesota. 50 farmers, they were producing 50,000 hogs a year. Their dream was to set up, uh, to buy an abandoned meat, meat, uh, meat works, meat uh, uh, abattoir, meat locker. And um, the dream was to uh, process all their, uh, their hogs into cut meat and when they met with uh, with a uh, facilitator the facilitator simply said to them okay it's 50 of you how many of you know how to sell uh, 50,000 hogs uh, per year as cut meat and nobody knew how to do that so <laughs> the, we said okay 50 of you 50 produce the hogs we need to get the marketing director and this is the way you find the person where you fund it, uh, you, you pay the salary. And then we need the financial manager. Who do you know who can handle um, um, hundreds of millions of dollars a year? <laughs> and um, the, one of the farmers said, you know, my best friend that just retired as vice president of our Mary Bank comes from this community. I will ask him to become the CFO. So the idea is that with enterprise facilitation is that you always identify what the uh, uh, skills of the participants are and then you very quickly identify whether they can make it whether they can sell it whether they can look after the money and nobody can do these three things so then you help them to form teams that can do beautifully those three things so, I so uh, counties say it's cheap uh, it's very grassroots um, you help people to understand what it takes to start a business and you help them to form little teams uh, and then only when the teams is formed and the marketing research is done you go look for money so I think that's a good lead into something else you wrote in your book which is and, and to explain this the Trinity of management and its importance yeah the Trinity of management uh, I discovered do, uh, discovered this uh, doing works and working with entrepreneurs um, I could never find anybody who, with the same passion and the same skill in making it, selling it, and looking after the money. So initially, I thought that uh, the reason why I could not find anybody who could do those three, beauty, those three things beautifully was because I was dealing maybe with rural clients in, uh, in poor communities. Um, so I thought, well, if these people cannot... Uh, produce it, sell it, and look after the money, why don't we help these producers to find somebody who can market the product? And why don't we help them to join up with somebody who understands finance? So I started to create this kind of uh, marriages of convenience where I would match five fishermen who were only very rough and young and uh, pretty <laughs> uh, unsophisticated. I matched these five uh, fishermen first to, uh, to each other because they all had the same product. And then I suggested that they would um, uh, you know, uh, employ um, the services of a marketing consultant to tell them where he would try to sell the tuna and the marketing consultant says, I will sell it to Japan. <laughs> and then uh, they said to the marketing consultant, okay, if we give you 140 tons of tuna, can you sell it for us? And the guy did a very quick calculation. And, see, and since he already had done the marketing research, he said, sure, I'll do it for you. Uh, then we discovered we got the wife of one of the fishermen who was a lady working a CPA, chartered accountant. She had worked in a bank for 13 years. She joined the company, uh, you know, um, full time. And we uh, sold 140 tons of tuna in Japan instead of 60 cents a kilo at $15 a kilo. <laughs> so they made $5.7 million in the first year. Um, and uh, I thought, okay, that was pretty, um, you know, uh, that was pretty easy. 
So another, when people started to come to me, I said, why don't you do what they did? You know, why don't you concentrate in doing what you love to do? But why don't you find people who can do beautifully what you hate doing? So uh, trade management was born uh, as a concept a couple of years into uh, telling people to form teams. And then when I came to America, I discovered that actually that was the way uh, Silicon Valley works, where uh, in Silicon Valley, as soon as you have uh, a half an, an idea, you start to talk to everybody. Uh, it's a very uh, collaborative environment. And you soon find out people who have experience in the fields where you don't have experience and you join forces. So uh, discover that the Silicon Valley, um, no company Silicon Valley was ever set up by one person. Uh, I said, uh, discover that actually what I was doing in rural country towns in Australia was uh, um, very valid uh, all over the world with uh, every entrepreneur. And I discovered the names of the people involved in the iconic uh, American companies. I discovered who was next to uh, Edison, Carnegie, Ford, Westinghouse, uh, um, you know, um, Henry Ford. Um, I discovered that nobody ever started the company alone. And that um, when I discovered that, then it gave uh, legitimacy to my idea that uh, um, the basis of a successful business is that the entrepreneur only does beautifully what she loves, but she's so clever that uh, surrounds uh, herself or himself with people who can do beautifully what um, the entrepreneur hates doing. Oh. So as soon as people understand that, then they are on the way of uh, um, embarking, creating a team. Uh, and creating a team um, is the most important thing for a, an entrepreneur. Bill Gates would have never set up Microsoft ever. He was playing poker at Harvard. He was Paul, it was Alan, Paul Allen that went there to say, they're doing it without us. Get out of there. Let's form the company. We know how to do it. The world is moving forward without us and we cannot allow that to happen because we have been pioneers of this. We should do it. Without Alan, uh, Bill Gates would have not uh, um, set up Microsoft. Wonderful. So uh, this, is, this is the story of uh, entrepreneurship, is a story of friendship, companionship, and the miracle of Silicon Valley is these two people. Silicon, you know, is uh, Yahoo, two people, Google, two people. Uh, but they always, uh, one was commercial, one was technical, and then they found the money. And that's the, it's a story that has been repeated time and time and time and time again. Well, we certainly saw that with uh, Hewlett Packard and we saw that with Apple Computer. And like you and said, Henry Ford. Uh, yeah. Henry Ford was, uh, went bankrupt twice be, uh, by age 46, was always alone, was a mad engineer. The only reason why the Ford, we have the Ford, is because is uh, 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 one of the investors, Mickelberg, Mikkel, said to him, uh, the only reason why I'll lend you money, if is, uh, you want to, if you employ my, uh, my man as your CFO, because Henry Ford was unmanageable otherwise. And so as soon as James Carson became the uh, CFO of Henry Ford, uh, then uh, he was able to uh, rein in the genius uh, um, uh, en uh, engineer and start to sell cars. And then wow. it was Henry Ford, James Cousin, and then they start with the idea of this, uh, the model, the, the, um, the, the model of selling car, which is uh, the uh, distributorship. Uh, they had 460 distributors for the Ford car when they started all over uh, America and Canada. So that's how the third time they were able to succeed. Well, we certainly know that's why Tesla didn't succeed is because he didn't have that partner with him that was reining him in. We have a question here. How does the Institute uh, look for and secure funds? Uh, we sell services. We sell services to uh, corporations, foundations, uh, anybody who wants to transform their community from a dormant community where the entrepreneurs do not know who to speak to, 
to a community where um, you know 250 uh, I, um, you know would be entrepreneurs come to speak to an enterprise facilitator that's the average numbers and so in that community you get between 20 and 40 startups and if you have a community a rural community or in a city uh, where the only thing you see from outside is uh, misery and the poverty the moment that you establish an enterprise facilitation program you start to, to see in, uh, how intelligent and how smart the local people are. You know, in Pacoima, in uh, a Latino in the city community in Los Angeles, the very first business uh, to be generated was uh, a, um, a, uh, a, a, a auto wash, you know, a car, a car washing service set up by this Latino uh, woman. And the second one was a, um, a childcare. And all of a sudden, all these ideas and all this intelligence came to the fore simply because there was a person there who was paid to shut up, listen, and help to find the people to form these teams of competence. Well, what's, you've now observed lots of entrepreneurs, and I, I'm sure in your mind you've developed a profile when you meet somebody, you think this person's got what it takes to be successful. What are the traits that you've noticed over time from successful entrepreneurs that you've worked with and studied? Why are they successful and others aren't? It's interesting because somebody said to me, Ernesto, we received funding for the government for 45 uh, 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 enter new enterprises a year, but we received 500 applications. So how do we, how, what criteria we should use to select out of 500 proposal, the 45 that we can fund? And uh, my answer was, uh, 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 have a look at the people that come to you. If they come alone, forget about it. Um, if they come with their mates, with the, with the team, then uh, consider it. Um, entrepreneurs are people who somehow uh, maybe under duress, but still are capable of working with others because nobody will ever succeed alone. There is absolutely no chance. Uh, there is no historical uh, evidence of a single human being who alone has set up a successful company. There is no record. Uh, there is not even a fiction book that describes a man who can make it, sell it, and look after the money. Not even a fiction book. So they, uh, to me, an entrepreneur is somebody who has a personality that is attractive to others uh, uh, or is somebody that can uh, uh, bite uh, your, his ego uh, uh, down and accept the idea that there are people who are smarter than him, uh, smarter than her, are doing what he should never be doing. Because if, for instance, if you have a character uh, if you hate people, you should never be at the front of the shop because it will show. There is no way that you can fake empathy. You can't fake it. You can fake it for a week, but not for a lifetime. So if you don't like people, you should never be dealing with the public. It's a little bit like what uh, 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 Matt uh, uh, um, said uh, when we uh, introduced this company today. If you set up a, uh, how come the, uh, you know, the people are nice, but uh, you know, the service that they deliver is, uh, is horrible. Um, probably because the people who designed the program were not uh, uh, empathetic people who absolutely love customer service. So they was designed by engineers, but not people who really love people. So I think that the, uh, the greatest opportunity, uh, the, for an entre the entrepreneurship cannot succeed if you are alone. So why would people uh, work with you? So in the why? book, uh, because they're excited about, uh, you've made them excited about what you're doing. People feed off of that and they feel like they can make a, a difference. I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you Otherwise, uh, yeah. So you have to have, uh, and the only way you are, uh, the, your competitive advantage is, uh, you know, your, the quality of what you do in your area of uh, expertise. 
So to be really attractive, to attract people to you, you have to have a, a passion and skill and dedication to what you do. Um, so if you try to do three things badly, you're going to be mediocre, you're going to be stressed, you're going to be uh, wishy-washy, and uh, you're not going to be very attractive. But if you are focused and passionate about what you do, oh wow, you can certainly attract people to you. If then you have a personality to say, I leave it to you because you are better than me at communication. I leave it to you. You show me the way. I spoke to somebody who was in the marketing uh, of uh, Apple and he was uh, working with uh, Steve Jobs. And what she told me was that so many times, you know, they were telling to Steve to get out of the room because they were better and he knew that they were better than him. So he would trust them and, uh, and if the, he dared to try to intervene, uh, they would kick him out of the room. And they could do that because Steve Jobs was smart enough to surround himself with people who were better than him in the fields of his own known uh, competence. Ernesto, we only have a couple more minutes left because I know that you have a hard stop at noon our time here for your next meeting. In the book, you talk about good and bad uh, product people, marketing people, finance people. And I think for entrepreneurs, one of the hard parts for them is to be able to evaluate and not waste money on people that really can't make a difference in their business. So what's the best way to go about evaluating these good and bad managers? You know, what are the, what's the profile? You have to, uh, what do you look for? You have to, well, uh, uh, traits is, uh, first of all, um, is uh, no matter, I mean, if you cannot actually be in the same room with that person, because you, you absolutely despise that person. No matter how competent the person can be, if you despise that person, you will not be able to uh, work with that person. Uh, so uh, first of all, you have to find somebody that shares some of your values and that, uh, remember, this person is going to tell you something that you are not going to like because product people, marketing people, finance people, they see the world differently. So if you're a product people, uh, a product person, you want to produce what you want, uh, you want to sell what you make. The marketing person is going to tell you that the market does not want what you make, but they want in a different color, in a different shape, in a different kind of flavor. So, and the finance person is going to tell you that they, no, you cannot have more money for more research. So remember, the people that you surround yourself with are going to tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. So uh, unless you like them, unless you re profoundly respect them, you will not be able to work with them. So first of all, you have to listen to your inner voice to say, do I like this person? Can I, would I have lunch with this person every day? In this kind of relationship, do I like this person? Because I have to be able to bite my tongue and accept what this person is telling me will always be a compromise. Am I, pre uh, I, am I prepared to do so? Then you have to look at, uh, is this person is effective? So how you find out? Well, before you marry, so before you, be, you, you start to uh, uh, invest uh, yourself in a relationship, uh, date for a while. Don't go into a partnership with somebody you don't know. Uh, use the same criteria for dating. You, you date before you marry. And I, I said to everybody, don't you ever go in a partnership without knowing the person very well. Uh, so start working together uh, and uh, uh, make sure that the person can deliver what the person is telling you that can deliver. Uh, one of the greatest mistakes is that you sign a partnership agreement and then you discover that the person, uh, you know, made commitments in your name that now you have to fulfill. So it's very, very dangerous. Um, so characteristics is, uh, um, there are all sorts of shapes and form. People come in every single uh, possible color. Uh, the reason why so many of the successful companies have started by friends is because they knew each other very well. And so my idea is try to go back 
to your really, really fantastic friend who was very different from you. Uh, and uh, and uh, I said to young people, don't look for people who are like you. Look for people who are different from you. Uh, people who see the world differently, but make sure that the values are shared and that you like to be in that room with that person. Do not compromise your ethics, for instance, if the person is repulsive to you. <laughs> uh, the fact that the person is wealthy or well-connected and right. telling you is not going to generate a successful company because sooner or later, you're going to blow up uh, the relationship. That's, a, a, that's actually excellent advice because I've been in a couple different ventures I started and I had a partner who was great in one, had to share the same work ethic that I did, was willing to give us all 24-7. And I had another partner who basically mailed it in after we got the financing and turned out to be a big drag on the business. And when we needed more money, the investors wouldn't put it in unless he was willing to leave and he wasn't willing to leave. And so that kind of cratered the business. Um, yeah. Can, what is the misconception about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship? The misconception is that uh, an entrepreneur, there is no difference between an entrepreneur and the company CEO. I think that uh, all of our education uh, system is based on teaching uh, uh, MBA classes uh, to everybody including to entrepreneurs. I think it's a terrible mistake because the MBA is a master in business administration and trains administrators. And administrators are not entrepreneurs, not at all. And, uh, uh, the difference between an entrepreneur and an administrator is this. The entrepreneur loves one thing. They are like a laser beam on product, for instance. You know, they are a stick job product best product in the world that's it that's what i want to do that's my passion that's my competitive advantage uh, so uh, the entrepreneurs are laser beams okay they only love one thing and they do it day and night incredibly passionately um, the administrator is not a la laser beam is diffuse light and the administrator covers product marketing finance so the administrator knows a little bit about each field, but is not passionate about any. If you get a CEO to become a bookkeeper, the CEO will resign. If you get the CEO to uh, go to trade all the trade fairs in the world, the CEO will resign. That's not my job, it's the marketing director's job. So what happens is that uh, the administrator is diffuse lights, hire is he or she hires and fires the product people, the marketing people, the finance people. Diffuse light, they know they love the business, not the specific uh, uh, product marketing or finance sector. The entrepreneur is a laser beam. The real entrepreneur is a laser beam. So what happens is that the moment that you get Steve Jobs in a university to do an MBA, Steve Jobs will not go or will walk out of the classroom to say, you want me to stop producing the best product in the world? to learn this rubbish that is motivating people, hiring, firing, who cares about that? That's not me. That's Steven Scully. And Scully was an administrator who ended up to, to even fire somebody like uh, Steve Jobs, not understanding that Steve Jobs was, was perfect for what he was doing. He was developing products. If you cannot allow somebody like Steve Jobs to develop products, you fire him, well, you destroy the company. So the administrators are diffuse like the uh, entrepreneur should never be told to stop doing beautifully what they love, to learn to do uh, in a mediocre way everything. So... Uh, I think that the difference is this. Uh, I work with entrepreneurs, not with managers. And I say to, uh, to entrepreneurs, only do what you love to do. Surround yourself with people who do beautifully what you hate doing. As soon as you can replace yourself, then assume a, uh, a, a position. In the moment that you can find somebody that is better than you in your area of competence, then you can decide whether you become the CEO, whether you have a manager, whether you become the president of the company. But until you cannot find anybody that is better than you at doing that specific 
uh, area of the company, of the startup, you should never relinquish that role because you are going to can, you are going to bomb, you are going to destroy your competitive advantage. I, when I, I work for a, a lot of great uh, entrepreneurs and uh, I work for a guy who built Senecor and sold it for four and a half billion from scratch. And he said to always uh, work your way out of a job. Just keep hiring. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Keep, keep hiring and make sure you're not the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Hire, hire smarter than you. Hire people are smarter than you. Uh, so, but surround yourself with people who are uh, different from you, uh, in cre uh, create diversity in your company. Uh, and uh, absolutely. And remember that the, uh, the reason why. Uh, nobody can be equally good at product marketing and finance is because actually uh, you require a certain wiring in your brain differently. The people who love to produce the product, they can spend 20 years in a lab in solitude developing it. If you want to spend 20 years in solitude in a lab, tell me, uh, where are your social manners and your passion for people is going to come from? <laughs> you hate people. That's why you are alone in a lab. <laughs> you already made your choice. So yeah. my point is we should really recognize that uh, uh, we is, uh, I call it the, uh, the project uh, beauty, the project of uh, Bellezza in Italian, the project beauty. Uh, a successful company is three beautiful people doing what they absolutely love to do. People who love to produce the product, the service, people who love to find out um, where people need it and what people really want. And then the uh, financial uh, people who are not only the bookkeepers, but they are the, uh, you know, the visionary finance people who really know how to guide the direction of the company from a financial standpoint. I have always noticed that all the great successful companies have a great product idea guy at the top, like a Steve Jobs or any of the other great product idea guys like Henry Ford and somebody who's good at management and finance below them. But when you get rid of the product guy at the top and you put the finance manager guy at the top, it rarely ever works out. In fact, when you look at Apple now, they're still living off of ideas that Steve Jobs really? developed. And he's yes, gone like a, a decade and they haven't come up with anything really new that they can say will carry them on for the next 25 years. Absolutely. They're done. They're yeah. done. And, That's they, how I, I and the people who are going to replace Apple already exist. Uh, they are in some uh, garage and uh, they will be, you know, exploding anytime. Like the people who are going to replace Google, they already exist. I mean, uh, they, they, you know, uh, I think boards get happy. I think boards who are made up mostly of finance people, like the venture capital people, get comfortable with people like themselves and are uncomfortable with people who have great imagination. And they feel like if, unless the thing is going successful, then they feel like, oh, we need to rein it in and we need to have that discipline. And that kind of kills the uh, business off. But so Mark, I have the impression that every single uh, uh, quality, the product people left to own their vices would self-destroy. A, a, a product person without marketing and finance would self-destroy. Of course. Because it will uh, keep producing forever new products. Uh, and when a product doesn't sell, it goes back into the, the, the workshop. Uh, the product person alone, you know who is the best uh, example of how a product person self-destructs? You remember the guy with the Segway? Yes. Yeah. $150 million in solitude. They never told anybody about this fantastic invention. When he came out with invention, uh, discovered that it could not be insured because uh, it could not go on the roads, could not on the sidewalks. They, the stuff was a toy. It was not a transformation in, in the transport industry that he, he, he told us uh, he was creating. So the Segway was a product person in solitude without the marketing, uh, the uh, intelligence, and without the finance, uh, he self-destructed. Marketing people self-destruct by himself. You remember the guy with the famous uh, island uh, uh, experience where he sold the tickets to 
50,000 people and then yep. there was nothing there. There was a marketing guy who, who went bust because he had he sold something they did not have. That's a typical market. Another marketing person is Theranos. You know, uh, what's yeah. her name? Uh, yeah. uh, Elizabeth uh, Holmes. Uh, she sold something that she didn't have. Marketing, only marketing, only pitching, 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 pitching. $800 million she blew. She, she destroyed $800 million of value in that. Uh, was a marketing uh, uh, with no product and no financial manager. Financial yeah. manager will go bust. Look at General Motors, uh, uh, taken over by the CFO. Instead of modifying the cars and making the car uh, wonderful, they started to use money to get people to buy, giving discounts. So they use money, <laughs> say buy rubbish, but it's cheap. But it's rubbish, you know, what are you talking about? It's rubbish. And, uh, you know, uh, my mechanic in South Dakota, when I first arrived in, uh, in America, my mechanic in South Dakota said, look at this, look at this, you know. It was a Chevrolet car, he said, it's the same engine for the 30 years, but they made the bodies uh, smaller, so now I cannot reach the uh, number one right. uh, spark plug because there is no room to get the number one spark plug out. He said, look at these idiots. The engine is the same six cylinder online, but they, they made the body so small that I cannot, uh, I, mechanic, cannot reach uh, number one spark plug. Our so he said, this is rubbish. Look at these people. So finance people took control of General Motors and they decided to use uh, cash incentives for people to buy rubbish. And the company went bankrupt. Well, so. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of that with Wang Laboratories and a whole host of companies that had once great names. I, I have one final question for you here, and I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I love your passion. Uh, and, and you've got uh, great experience and, and stories to tell us. What magazines, podcasts, books, aside from your own, do you recommend entrepreneurs read? Uh, right now, right now, uh, there is a book that I really recommend to everybody. Uh, I don't know whether you guys uh, seen it. Is uh, this one? Winners take all. Winners take all. Uh, because this book is about this, and um, and for the last ten years, we have been under the uh, delusion that uh, the very wealthy entrepreneurs then they will use philanthropy to change the world. And this guy, uh, this, uh, uh, who was in Davos, who had uh, basically seen how that kind of uh, um, greenwash and uh, brandwash uh, has been uh, uh, played, uh, basically saying it's absolute rubbish. People create the problem, cannot fix it. If you, if you have a, a you made money by, um, by capitalizing on some other people, resources, or uh, uh, of labor, uh, why don't you pay those poor bastards <laughs> instead of uh, making wage. the money and then giving the money to the Africans with your charitable organization? So basically, it's an expose, witness takes all, it's an expose. But what I'm reading now is uh, uh, um, a very large book called Enlightened Capitalism which talks about the story uh, about some of the absolute extraordinary Americans and English uh, entrepreneurs who for the last 200 years have um, been pioneers in the way you create companies which are absolutely extraordinary citizens of uh, the world. And uh, the story of how beautifully the, the companies were run in terms of economy, uh, relations with the workers, environmental, I mean, they, they were gems, absolutely gems. And it shows, and uh, you already mentioned this, Mark, and it shows what happened as soon as those companies go public, and now you have the faceless uh, stockholders uh, who then say, we don't give a damn about your uh, uh, vision of a fantastic uh, company. What we want is short-term profits. So. Uh, there is uh, a tension between the enlightened capitalists and the, uh, a, a faceless uh, uh, market that is using algorithm to point, uh, to bet 
on, uh, uh, on quarterly um, uh, you know, results. I think that we have to be very, very, very careful because right now the world needs desperately to gain, regain trust in corporations. Uh, young people don't want to go and work for corporations. They despise corporations. And they said, as a millennial, I don't want to go and work with people who have absolutely nothing to look for except the uh, quarterly um, um, statements. And uh, the people inside the corporations, they don't benefit from those quarterly statements. Actually, they feel that they are held uh, at ransom by the faceless uh, stockholders. Ernesto, loved having you. I hope when you come out with another book that we'll chat again. And I will uh, make sure that everybody gets the link to your uh, book now. And I'm glad that Martha had shared uh, with everybody how to reach you and how to get your books and engage with your institute. So thank you very much. Thank you to all of you who persevered today uh, with our technical issue. And we look forward to seeing you. We have another program on Friday and I'll be sending an email out about that. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And thank uh, you, Mark. stay cool. Thank you. Thank you Take to care. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.